I applied to university to study medicine, but switched courses to do maths so that I would have more time to write poetry. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at my life choices. <laughs> <laughs> um, and apart from one of the first poems I wrote being a love poem about prime numbers, I told myself that the two weren't really that linked. I liked maths because there was always a definite right answer, and I liked poetry because there wasn't a definite wrong one. Um, but for me, when I switched courses to do maths, I was given the option of doing maths with a year abroad. And I thought that would be a fun way to live in another country and experience another culture. So for a year, I lived and studied maths in Germany. And I thought it would be a good idea to try and learn German because I'd heard it was really popular there. <laughs> when I arrived in Germany, my level of language speaking was approximately, Hallo, my name is Tari. Ich bin English. Sprechen Sie English? <laughs> <laughs> Nein. Scheiße. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, as the year went on, my language skills improved slightly, and I'd like to share a couple of things that I learned along the way. Now, I am aware that I am talking about learning German in a German-speaking country whilst relying on everybody to understand my English, but don't worry, my English is unfassbar gut. What struck me about learning a second language is that whilst everybody has that same destination in mind of hopefully becoming fluent, the journeys that we go on are very different. And measuring your progress on that journey using verb tables and grammar exams, whilst helpful for some, for me didn't fully capture the excitement of what it was to learn another language. So I began to set up my own milestones for when I knew that I was making progress. The first was that once those basic building blocks are in place, being able to trust your instincts. I remember explaining a story to a friend where everything had worked out in the end and come together nicely, and I found myself using the words, Alice had geklappt. Now, I don't think I'd ever heard that word before, but as I said it, it kind of made sense to me, because if you clap, that's a very literal coming together of your hands, but also if you make a plan and it works out, sometimes you feel like giving yourself a mini round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> the difference was that when I said this word, I knew that it was the right word to use in that context because it felt natural. Up until that point, if I didn't know what a word was in German, I would just try and say the English word with a German accent <laughs> and try and get away with it. But more often than not, that left me looking like ein Idiot. <laughs> the second stage for me was when you first begin to dream in another language. A lot of people talk about this as for all of your external efforts. This is the point when you know that it's finally started to sink in. And the first dream that I had in German, I dreamt that I was in a German classroom learning some new vocabulary. <laughs> which meant that not only had my subconscious taken in enough German that I could understand so that I could dream about it, it had also taken in some German that I couldn't yet understand and was trying to teach it to me in my sleep. <laughs> Now, whilst I don't think this is the most foolproof method of learning a language, it was quite exciting at the time. Uh, but the third stage for me, and the moment when I really knew that everything would be okay, is when you were able to either understand or make jokes in another language. Uh, I absolutely love puns, and whenever any of my non-English friends are able to make puns in English, I'm always really impressed. Uh, so a moment came when I was speaking to my German friend who was a poet, and he was talking about how when he has ideas, they begin to snowball into each other into a kind of ideas avalanche. And he told me that the German word for avalanche was lavina. Now, without skipping a beat, I said to him, hey, If there was a lot of snow between the months of March and May, would that be called an Avril Lavina? <laughs> and he said, that's hilarious. <laughs> you should definitely put that in your TED talk. They'll all laugh lots. <laughs> I think being able to play with another language is a very exciting thing, and it's not something that you always get an opportunity to do, in particular grammar exams. Or they don't give you bonus marks for puns, anyway. What I was experiencing was something that I had experienced before, something that at school, me and my bitter math rival slash best friend Luke had called the nerd rush. This is the feeling that you got when you first wrapped your head around a concept or were able to solve a problem in a particularly neat way. This was a feeling that I later experienced when I started writing poetry, whether it was when the words just seemed to fall into place 
or whether it's coming up with a particularly satisfying rhyme, or maybe even just thinking of a ridiculous pun. For me, the difference was now that I was getting this in day-to-day -day conversations, whether it was the thrill of being understood by the person in front of me, or just having a kind of slight idea about what they were talking about, piecing together simple sentences became like mini equations to be solved there and then. It involved the pattern recognition and attention to detail that I love from maths, and it combined it with the creativity and the ability to think outside of the box that I really enjoyed about poetry. It combined the two in a way that I had not previously thought about. And in many ways, German is quite a logical and mathematical language. I remember asking my housemates what the German word for a kettle was, and I said to them, how do you call the thing that cooks the water? And they said, das ist ein Wasserkocher. And for me, it just made perfect sense. And there were all of these moments where <laughs> I would be really excited. I remember when I found out, I came home and I said to them that the German word for glove is handshoe, because it's like a little shoe that you put on your hands. <laughs> and I thought, that's incredible. And they said, why are you so excited about gloves? <laughs> um, but I came up with this whole list of my favorite words, my absolute favorite. I learned that the German word for turtle is Schildkröte, which is like a kind of shield toad. Um, and when I found that out, I immediately looked up what a snail was, because I hoped that it would be a kind of shield worm. Uh, <laughs> it turns out that the German word for snail is Schnecke, but the German word for slug is Nacktschnecke, because it's like a naked snail. <laughs> and I thought that was fantastic. And my housemate said, why have you brought snails home? Um, <laughs> but in a way, this, this sticking together of words could be quite poetic. Uh, I, I remember learning that the German word for iris is Regenbogenhaut, which translates as rainbow skin, which I think is kind of quite beautiful and still has that weird sort of logic to it. Similarly, I found out the German word for nipple is Brustwarzer, <laughs> which means breast wart, <laughs> which, whilst less beautiful, <laughs> still... <laughs> still got that weird kind of logic to it. Um, so I thought it would be fun to try and invent my own words. Um, and where I lived, in Hanover, there's quite a large Turkish uh, population. So there's a lot of places that sell kebab and derna and also falafel. And I was really happy to find out the German word for falafel is falafel. <laughs> um, but the German word for spoon is luffel. So if you had a specific spoon that you only ever ate falafel with, you could call it a falafel luffel. <laughs> so I've written a poem called Falafel <laughs> um, and it's about a guy called Phil. Uh, you might be able to see where this is going. It does, it does involve some kind of call and response, which is entirely in German, but I think you guys will be slightly better at that than they are back in England. Phil is voll. Die Nacht ist gut verlaufen. Phil sieht ein Geschäft und er fragt, was sie verkaufen. Falafel. -Löffel. Falafel, fal, falafel, which means falafel spoons. For spoonfuls of falafel, was? Falafel, 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 fal, falafel, wie falafel, falafel, fal, falafel. Phil doesn't speak German, so he's left a little baffled. <laughs> See, there's this fella, Phil, and Phil loved falafel. In a falafel raffle, he would snaffle all the tickets. He always answers in affirmative to offers of falafel, even if he's awfully, fully, fill awful if he didn't. <laughs> and for us, it might feel effortless to live a life falafelless. <laughs> <laughs> but Phil effervesces, he lets he get his falafel fixed. So if Phil was ever to be offered luffel of falafel, he'd say yes, despite knowing what the effer luffel is. For Phil, a life of love and laughter. We'll have a falafel after. <laughs> so it's yes, it's better knowing what the f is. If a falafel fill a full of fill a fill awful. <laughs> so it's yes, it's better knowing what the f is. A fluffy falafel is often iffy if he's honest, but it's yes, it's better knowing what the f is. A far falafel, a puffy falafel is a villy leaf, a leaf, a nice leaf, a heasel of a message for his kids saying yes, it's better knowing what the f is. Always yes, it's better knowing what the f is. 
So when I say, we feel falafel is zu viel falafel, which of course means how much falafel is too much falafel, could you reply in unison as one, falafel falafel is zu viel falafel. <laughs> which of course means four spoonfuls of falafel is too much falafel. Uh, if anyone doesn't speak German, I can talk you through it. If you repeat after me, fear, yeah. luffel full, falafel, is zu viel, falafel. Wunderbar. Wie viel Falafel ist zu viel Falafel? Vier Löffel viel Falafel ist zu viel Falafel. Wie viel Falafel ist zu viel Falafel? Lauter, wie viel Falafel ist zu viel Falafel? Schneller, wie viel Falafel ist zu viel Falafel? Vier Löffel viel Falafel ist zu viel Falafel. If it left him on his deathbed with the message for his kids saying, Yes, it's better knowing what the falafel is. Always, yes, it's better knowing what the falafel is. Viel Falafel. Die Nacht war gut verlaufen. <lacht> Willst du ein Geschäft und ich frage, was sie verkaufen? Falafelöffel. Falafel, Falafel. Falafel, Falafel. Falafel, Falafel, Falafel. Ja, Falafelöffel. Falafel, Falafel, Falafel. You've got to make an effort when you travel. One of my favorite poets in the UK, uh, called Disraeli, once said to me that learning another language is like learning to think in another color. And I've spoken to other people who say they feel like they have different personalities in different languages. And I learned quite early on, uh, whilst learning German, that when I express an opinion in English, I will often say things such as, I think maybe, if you want, we could possibly do this. Or, I feel like, you know, if it's not too much trouble, possibly we could do that. And whilst in English, that just makes me sound very unsure of myself, uh, in German, it rapidly affects the sentence structure and meant I didn't know where to put the verbs. Um, <laughs> so the result of this was that the German Harry became a lot more decisive and direct about what he wanted to say than English Harry, purely because I lacked the language skills to be able to doubt myself in that way. <laughs> uh, which was an incredible thing. Um, another side effect was that whilst in English, uh, I think I'm slightly more comfortable talking to a thousand strangers than one-on-one -on -one kind of small talk, um, in German, because I was so excited about learning the language, uh, small talk with strangers became like homework. Uh, I was really excited to ask questions and learn quite simple facts about other people's lives because that was the sort of vocabulary that I could understand. Uh, similarly, I was really excited to talk about myself because I needed the practice. And so whilst German taught me a link between maths and poetry that I hadn't previously been able to imagine, it also taught me things about my own personality that I hadn't expected. And I realized that these milestones I'd given myself in German and learning a language were things that I'd seen before. When it came to maths, whilst it might be difficult at first to get your head around the basic building blocks, once they're in place, I think then you can begin to have fun with it and jump between them and trust your instincts whilst doing that. When it comes to writing, uh, if you can immerse yourself enough in the world of a poem or a story, then it becomes possible for these ideas to seemingly come from nowhere. I've, I've often gone to bed or just fallen asleep in the daytime whilst writing a poem, and when I wake up, there'll be a new idea there that's almost as if I've tried to teach it to myself in my dreams. Um, and the final thing was with these two things, as with learning German, as with many other aspects of my life, I realized that once you've put the work in, if you can get comfortable enough with something and be willing to take risks, but also have fun with it, that's when you can really start to put yourself out there. After I finished my year abroad, uh, I came back to my final year at university in Bristol, and I was moved up from the beginner's German class to the advanced German class. Um, and whilst at the end of the year I did quite well in my listening and speaking exams, I still managed to fail my final grammar exam. Um, 
I did, however, pass my math degree, and since then, I've been able to do the poetry full-time and travel around the world doing what I love doing. So in a way, it's been quite a unique and weird journey, but everything has. Good clap.